Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being with us today. We're really glad you're here. We pray our service will be a blessing to you. Today is the 18th Sunday after Pentecost, and again, in the month of October, we're going to be celebrating the 500th anniversary uh, of the Reformation, and each Sunday we're going to focus on a certain part of the Reformation, a teaching that was proclaimed, uh, proclaimed and defended then, something that we still want to proclaim and defend even now. And today we're going to focus on the Bible, and the Bible as the only true source for Christian doctrine. So that's what we'll take a look at today. We'll have a special service, and uh, we'll have it again projected in the front. We'll talk more about that in a second. But for now, we'll start with the opening hymn. You may remain seated. For various portions of our liturgy today, we're going to have music playing in the background, and then we'll do a part of the liturgy, and that'll lead in then, lead in then into singing a verse of a hymn. So we'll start. If you're following in the bulletin, we are on page three. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Oh, how I love your law. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies. I have more insight than all my teachers. How sweet are your words to my taste. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness.
Yet so often we have despised God's word and failed to gladly hear and learn it. For all this and all our sins, we bow before God and humbly ask his forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God gave his word so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The scriptures testify about Jesus who lived a perfect life for you, died on the cross to pay for all your sins, and rose again to assure you of your salvation. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We pray. O triune God, it is in your word that you have chosen to reveal your person, your will, and the full and free salvation you give us through God the Son, Jesus Christ. May God the Holy Spirit work in each of us so that we may believe your word for our salvation and follow it for your glory. We pray this through Jesus Christ, God the Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Our first scripture lesson today is written in the seventh chapter of the Gospel of Luke. We start with verse 1. This scripture lesson and then a later scripture lesson both emphasize the fact that we are to simply listen to the Lord, take him at his word. He says it, so we believe it. He says it, so we are willing to do it. When Jesus had finished all this in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. There a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some soldiers, or sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, This man deserves to have you do this, because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house 
and found the servant well. So far, our first scripture lesson will continue with a responsive reading of various scripture verses reminding us of, the, of how faithful and true God's word is and how we are to follow it. Again, we'll have music playing in the background, and this will lead us then into various hymn verses. The unfolding of your words gives light. Your word, O Lord, is eternal. All your words are true. All scripture is God-breathed. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man. When you received the word of God which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men. You know with all your heart and soul that not one of all the good promises the Lord your God gave you has failed. This is the one I esteem. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. So be careful to do what the Lord your God has commanded you. Blessed are those who hear the word of God, that the one who has my word. Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, your statutes are my delight. They are my counselors.
Your word is a lamp to my feet. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. You have been born again, not a perishable seed, but of imperishable. From infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures. All Scripture is God-breathed. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. We'll rise for the gospel lesson. The Holy Gospel is written in the fifth chapter of St. Luke. We start with the first verse. Again, the Lord tells the disciples to fish at the worst place at the worst time. Peter simply says, because you say so, we will let down the nets. Uh, hopefully the attitude the Spirit can work in all of our hearts whenever we hear the Lord speak, because you say so. Uh, we'll believe, we'll follow, we'll obey. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. So far, the gospel lesson. Please be seated. We'll continue with the next hymn.
will rise. Your word, O Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Amen. The words of God we'll consider this morning are written in the 10th chapter of the Apostle Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. We'll start in the middle of verse 4. We tear down thoughts such as all arrogance that rises up against the knowledge of God, and we make every thought captive so that it is obedient to Christ. This is God's word. Please be seated. In the name of God, the Holy Spirit, who has inspired and given us the Holy Scriptures, dear children of God. The year 1521, the month, April, day 18. The country was Germany, the city was Worms. The focus of the attention was on a German monk named Martin Luther. He was standing before the emperor and many of the other secular leaders. With a simple word, the emperor could have arrested Luther, tortured him, and had him killed. He had summoned Luther to appear because he wanted Luther to take back the things that he had written. He wanted him to recant. And he was asked then to give a simple answer to that simple question. Will you or will you not recant? This was his answer. Your imperial majesty and your lordships demand a simple answer. Here it is plain and unvarnished, unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scriptures or by clear reason, for I do not trust either in the Pope or councils alone, since it is well known that they have often erred and contradicted themselves. I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. Here I stand, I can do no other. God help me, amen. Why was Martin Luther unwilling to back down on what he had written? Why was he willing to recant, and take back what he had taught? Because he knew It was from the Bible. This is what the Bible says, so I have to follow it. And he knew that those important truths of paramount importance, he knew that the Bible is true. The Bible is right. I have to listen to the Bible. He knew that God the Holy Spirit had chosen the writers, that he had been in them, working through them, guiding them, carrying them along so that they wrote exactly what he, God the Holy Spirit, wanted. So he knew that the Word of God, the Bible, there's an equal sign between them. The Word of God is the Bible, the Bible is the Word of God. And he knew again that he couldn't back down or take back what God had said in his Word. And that's what we'd like to think about today as we look at these words of God before us. He knew the Bible is true, the Bible is right. I have to listen to the Bible. So let's use that thought as our theme as we look at these words of God before us. And we know what Jesus said, what he promised, what he predicted that as we get closer and closer to the end of the world, there's going to be more and more false teachings, there's going to be more and more false teachers. And the list of false teachings is, it almost seems endless. 
Uh, whatever the Bible says, the devil tries to come up with wrong teachings about it, or he tries to contradict it, or tries to tell people that it's wrong or that you don't have to listen to it. Starting with who is the true God? Who is the one we should worship? What is he like? What does he want from us? What does he say? Do we have to listen or do we not have to listen? How can we be right with them? And of course, one of the worst lies of all times, trying to convince people that they can be right with God by the things that they do in their lives. Uh, there's false teachings all around us about marriage, what it should be, who needs or uh, who is allowed by God to enter into that estate, uh, what consenting adults should be able to do with their own lives. There's questions about baptism, questions about the Lord's Supper, God's rules for men and women, church fellowship, uh, Jesus, who he is, what he has done, his deity, his virgin birth, his resurrection, that he's the only savior of the world. All these things and more. The devil is trying to attack. And you never know who might challenge you on what the Bible says. People might try to prove that you're wrong or maybe not talking about what you think and believe. They'll simply say that this is what we think, this is what we believe, this is what we think is right. You should listen to us, you should follow us. And coming up sometimes with hard questions that we don't always know the answers to right away, simply trying to get us to doubt ourselves and to wonder, maybe they're right. And maybe I'm wrong, maybe my church is wrong. And the only way to deal with them properly is to go back to the Bible and simply say, look at what it says. Hmm? The Bible is true. The Bible is right. Know what we're told here. We tear down thoughts such as all arrogance that rises up against the knowledge of God. There's people who are arrogant, uh, arrogant enough to think that they know better than God or that they know better than the Bible or that they think that they're smart enough that they can pass judgment on the Bible and what it says. So they come up with their ideas, their arguments. He says we tear them down, but how? We make every thought captive so that it is obedient to Christ. Before I can deal with various teachings that are out there, talk about them or answer them, first and foremost, I have to take my mind and make it a captive, obedient to Christ. And the word there for captive, pretty much what it sounds like, Okay? If somebody is your captive, you have control over them, right? Uh, you can force them to do what you want them to do. And that's what we're supposed to do with our minds, our thoughts, our ideas, our beliefs, our attitudes. We are to force them to be obedient to Christ. Whatever I think, I'm supposed to think the way Jesus wants me to. I'm to believe the way Jesus wants me to. My attitudes, my ideals, they're to be in line with what Jesus wants. And how do I know what Jesus wants? I know it from the Bible, right? It's in the Bible that the one true God reveals himself and tells me the truth, the truth he wants me to know, believe, and follow. And how many passages don't Point that out to us. Proverbs 3, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. <clears throat> Certain things may make sense to me. I might think this is the way I think it should be, but that doesn't matter. I'm to trust in the Lord. What does he say? That's what's right. Jesus says, if you continue in my word, you are really my disciples. He says, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. What did the Lord say to Joshua? Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. In the Psalms, he says, the law of the Lord is perfect. And that word law has the idea of instruction that he gives us. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy. And that's what I have to keep telling myself as I live my life. That's part of fighting the good fight of faith. That's part of sometimes crucifying the sinful nature that's in me, that I have to force my thoughts, my ideals, my beliefs, 
I have to make them be obedient to Christ. I have to force them to be in line with the Bible. And there's times I do have to force my mind to do this because I'm sinful and I have the sinful nature inside of me. And the sinful nature opposes God. It hates God and whatever God says and it tries to mix me up It will do anything it can to try to lead me away from God and what he says. And of course, the devil wants to work with my sinful nature and the thoughts it tries to produce in my mind. Uh, There's times where uh, the sinful nature will produce feelings inside of me that are not in line with God's word. And regardless of what many people say, you can't always trust your feelings because feelings can come from the sinful nature. And so there's times then where I have to Again, force myself to rise above, to fight against feelings that I have. There's times I have to force myself to think the way that God wants me to think. And it's not always easy, right? Because again, there are certain things that part of me would like to do, part of me would like to believe. And that's where sometimes, again, I need to be tough on myself. A part of me might think, Well, they love each other, they're consenting adults, it's okay if they do what they want to do. Or the Bible or the devil might try to work in me that, hey, you're an adult, you're free, you live in a free country, if it feels right to you, go ahead and do what you want to do. And that's, again, where I have to tell myself, no, that's not in line with the Bible. I cannot let myself think that way. I cannot let myself do that. Now, there's parts of me that might think. I see what other people do, and if they can do it, why can't I do it too? Fair is fair. And there again, I cannot let myself think that way. That's not in line with the Bible. I have to fight against that. And... The list can go on, and the devil knows where we're vulnerable, where we struggle, and that's where he'll try to try to attack us. Hmm? You know what they did? You know what they did to me. After what they did, I'm going to hate them, and I'm not going to rest until I find some way to get back at them. And then I have to tell myself that I can't think that way. That's not what the Lord wants me to do. That's not in line with what the Bible says. We see other people and well, the attitudes they have towards marriage. And, and we know from the Bible that there are times God allows divorce, adultery, and desertion. But for many other people, this is harder than I thought. We're not, it's not working out. I don't know if we love each other anymore. Why should we stay and make ourselves unhappy? Why don't we just end it? And then it I can't let myself think that. That's not what the Bible says. And of course, we hear the opinions of other people that sometimes sound very logical, and sometimes they're phrased to make it sound very loving, right? And we used the example before, oh, they're they're two consenting adults, they love each other, they found happiness. Why can't you just let them live their lives the way that they want? even though they are of the same gender or even though they're not married. And then we have to tell ourselves that's not what the Bible says. I cannot let myself think that. Um, You've heard some of these before. Why would you want a child to be brought into the world that's not going to be loved? They know from the ultrasound it's going to have some problems? Why bring a child into the world that's not going to have a good quality of life and is not going to be loved? And then we have to tell ourselves, I cannot let myself think that way. That's not in line with the Bible. I have to fight against that. Or is it really that important to follow everything the Bible says? As long as you've got maybe some of the main points, I mean, who cares about the rest, eh? Um, Does it really matter if people believe that God created the world in six days? 
Does it really matter if people believe in the miracles or, oh, come on, a loving God would never condemn anyone to hell. As long as people are sincere and they're true to themselves, does it matter what God they believe in as long as they're trying their best because God, again, would never condemn somebody who's sincere? And again, we have to that's not what the Bible says. I cannot let myself think that. I cannot let myself follow that. See, again, that's one of the devil's tactics for trying to destroy people. And we have to tell ourselves, the Bible is true. The Bible is right. I have to listen to the Bible. Hmm? And maybe one other thing that you know, the devil tries to attack people with is how they deal with their sins. And many times, two extremes. One, people get oh, nonchalant, flippant, or just have a I-don't-care attitude. So I did what was wrong. What's the big deal? Who cares? Nobody's perfect. Uh, everybody messes up now and then. You know, it's not that big a deal. In fact, if I have the chance, I'm going to do it again. And then we have to tell ourselves, no, I cannot let myself think that way about sin. The Lord is serious about sin, so I have to be serious about sin. And then the other extreme. Hmm? I can't believe what I did. That was so awful, so horrible, so terrible. I can't believe that that's ever going to be forgiven. There's no way God can love me after what I've done. And especially then, I have to tell myself, I can't let myself think that way. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says the blood of Jesus' his Son purifies us from all sin. All sins have been forgiven because of Jesus. And there's times where maybe I might even be tempted to, to hate myself because of what I've done. And then even again, no, I can't feel that way about myself because... God has said, I am his child. I am to belong to him, live for him. He loves me and accepts me, and I can be glad about that. And, you know, troubles come and hardships come, and people think, yeah, of course God is not going to be for me anymore. Of course he's going to send me all these troubles and hardships after what I've done. There's no way he's going to listen to me. There's no way he's going to help me. I might as well just give up. And then again, I have to shake my head. I cannot let myself think that way. That's not what the Bible says. I have to listen to the Lord because he's right. That even in the worst of trials and troubles, God still loves me, and he's still working to bless me in the way that is best. And even, you know, I go to the Lord's Supper, and there's things there that go beyond my understanding. But I tell myself, the Bible is true, the Bible is right. This really is his body. The Bible is true, the Bible is right. This really is his blood. The Bible is true, the Bible is right. I really am forgiven for all. God really does love me. He really is going to take me to heaven when I die. And we mentioned a little bit ago, one of the devil's main tactics in destroying a church or a church body, individual people, or a whole nation, one of his main tactics is to do whatever it takes so that people will start to think and eventually believe. They'll tell themselves, well, maybe the Bible isn't always true. Maybe the Bible isn't always right. 
maybe we don't always have to listen to what it says. And once he gets people to that attitude, then the door is open for them to throw out basically anything they don't want to believe. And they throw out more and more and more until ultimately, what do we see? There's people out there who claim to be Christian but don't even have really a Christian faith anymore. And with all these attitudes all around us, we have to remember that we have to take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Regardless of what's going on around me, I have to tell myself, the Bible is true, the Bible is right, I have to listen to the Bible. And that's why Martin Luther took the stand that he did. Uh, he knew it would have taken one word and he would have been put to death. But he knew, I cannot go against what the Bible says. So, he said, I cannot and I will not recant. Here I stand, I can do no other. And that's really our prayer then, 500 years later. With all the false teachings that are out there, with the sinful nature that I have and how it tries to affect my sinful mind, please, Lord, help me to be the same way. Help us as people, help us as a congregation, help us as a church body, that it's the same attitude. Here we stand. We can do no other. God help us. God help us to always remember the Bible is true, the Bible is right. We have to listen to the Bible. Amen. And we'll rise. <clears throat> and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And we'll join in confessing our Christian faith according to the words of the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed, we read, We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. We'll continue with the offering, and as we gather it, we'll sing the posted hymn verses.
You may remain seated, and we'll continue with the response of prayer if you're following in the bulletin. We're on page 12. O blessed triune God, we thank you for revealing yourself and your truth on the pages of the Holy Scriptures. We thank you also, dear Lord, for assuring us that God the Holy Spirit has inspired each and every word in the Bible. We thank you, O Triune God, for working through the words of the Bible to lead us to know you, the only true God and for leading us to see our sins and the danger we are in because of them. We are especially thankful that the Bible proclaims to us the facts about Jesus, God the Son, who has rescued us from our sins and won for us eternal life. Praise be to you, O triune God, for the gift of your word. In your word, you give us wonderful promises to nourish our faith and to encourage us as we live in this sinful world. Lord, we know that your word often goes contrary to our human reason. There are times when you tell us to do or believe things that make no sense to our human thinking. Lord, we know that there are many in the world who hate your word and speak against it. They also attack and belittle us who believe everything in it and strive to follow it. Many of these same people who hate your word are doing all they can to prevent us from proclaiming it freely and openly. They also do all they can to keep others from hearing it and believing it. Regardless of how the enemies of the Bible may try to prevent your word from being proclaimed, respected, and followed, we trust, Lord, that you will preserve your word and cause it to be proclaimed throughout the world. Please, Lord, keep us faithful to you and to all of your word. Help us and work through us so that we will preserve its truth and proclaim its message to the whole world.
Once again, Lord, we offer you thanks and praise for the gift of your holy word. Hear us now as we bring you our private petitions. We'll rise for the Lord's Prayer. Please hear us now as we pray the prayer your Son has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And we'll continue with the communion liturgy. The Lord be with you. The cup of blessing that we bless. The bread that we break. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Please be seated. As is noted in the bulletin, we practice close communion. Therefore, we ask only members of our congregation or another Wisconsin Synod congregation to come forward. By doing this, we don't mean to pass judgment on anyone's